Hi, my name is Kate Hanch. My pronouns are she and her, and I am honored to serve as one of the associate pastors here at First St. Charles. Welcome friends in St. Charles and around the world. It is so good to be with you today. So I have a question for you. What stories do you tell that inform your own identity? What stories do we as a church tell that say something about our identity? And what stories do we as a nation tell about how we were formed? Well, there's several reasons for asking that question. Next year, our church is celebrating our 200th year in existence. And that is amazing. And one of our church members, Valerie, has been working over time, collecting documents and researching archives about the history of our church. And I heard some stories that I have never heard before and it's fascinating to read and look at. And I am so thankful for Valerie. Another reason I asked that question is that we've just begun a series, a sermon series on parables. And if you haven't watched Pastor Bart's sermon on Sunday, you should, it's good. But parables are stories that are meant to shock and surprise and befuddle us. Well, I'd like to share a story about our own history in St. Charles in the United States. I'm reminded of Sacagawea. Do you know who Sacagawea is? We may call her Sacagawea. For those of you who do not remember her, Sacagawea was the Native American woman who accompanied Meriwether Lewis and William Clark on their exploration of the Louisiana Purchase. She was born in the area now known as Idaho and was captured by a neighboring tribe and eventually sold as an enslaved person to a French fur trader. This fr French fur trader took her as his wife. And I say that in air quotes because power differentials meant that she would more like functioned as an enslaved person. Sacagawea became pregnant, and while she was six months pregnant, Lewis and Clark came to her settlement and saw value in taking her and the fur trader along with them. After she gave birth to her son in February, that April she, with the baby on her back, accompanied Lewis and Clark along their expe expedition. But she didn't just accompany them though, she saved them. She saved Lewis and Clark's journals, navigational papers, and her baby when the boat almost capsized. Talk about superwoman. And she sometimes walked along the shores of the Missouri River to look for potential dangers. She found edible plants and roots to survive. She navigated what is now known as the Bozeman Pass on the Yellowstone River. And when the group encountered Native American tribes, she translated for them, negotiating for supplies or horses. Once, in one of those negotiations, she encountered her brother, whom she hadn't seen for five years. After a brief reunion, she perhaps reluctantly returned to the group, aching for her family. Her presence as a woman with a baby helped Wilson Clark's group seem less fearsome and more approachable. She led them all the way to the Pacific and back, surviving inclement weather, disease, and lack of food and water. While the fur trader, her husband, received some money and land acreage for the journey, Sacagawea received nothing. And for the most part, except for those coins, we as a nation forgot about Sacagawea. I went to Lewis and Clark Middle School in Jefferson City, Missouri, but there was no Sacagawea Middle School. 
In St. Charles Frontier Park along the Missouri River, there's a giant statue of Lewis and Clark and their big dog. But where's the statue of Sacagawea? The most memorable thing we have about her is that dollar co coin, which was discontinued because it was unpopular. If it wasn't for Sacagawea, Lewis and Clark exposition would have never happened. We would have not had their journals, their maps, or their records. She had to leave her family and her social support to go on the journey. And she didn't really have a choice in her enslavement. But she did serve as a translator between the Ma Native American tribes and the expedition. Despite her status, and frankly, men using her for their own purpose. She helped them succeed and helped them survive. As we read the stories of scripture and the stories that form our identity, both ourselves personally, our families, and a nation, maybe, just maybe, we can think about those whose stories remain unto untold or mostly forgotten. And maybe in honoring their words and honoring their witness, we can see God more clearly, clearly in the presence of our neighbors and our family and our world. And maybe just maybe, we begin to tell stories a little differently. Will you pray with me, please? God of Abraham and Sarah, God of Hagar, we thank you for the people whose stories don't often get told the people who long live in the shadows, but when uncovered are realized to be gifts to us and our community, and who may in fact save us. Let us long to unearth stories that are forgotten, to ask people about their stories who have never been asked before, and in doing so, may we see you more clearly in the witness of our neighbor. In Jesus' name we pray, by the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in every one of us. Amen.